Welcome, Lord Mayor of Torren, Jesus Ross, the General Director of University, Research and Science, Virginia Tapa Mertiana, the Vice Principal for Research and Science Policy of the University of Valencia, Councillors, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank you all for attending to the opening session of the fifth International Symposium Recent Advanced Design Quantitative Remote Sensor. 15 years after the first one in 2002, the fifth. We never thought we would reach a fifth edition, but here we are. This has been possible thanks to the support of many people. First, to the research community. This time, near 200 people from 20 countries. Dear friends, uh, thanks for your fidelity. More than 40% of you repeat every time. A big thank you for being here one more time. Now, I'd like to take this opportunity to express my thanks to the organists and people that have supported us. First, to the City Council of Torrent. Special thanks to the Mayor of Chubros and second, Mass Deputy Alfred Costa and also to the corporation and the staff of the City Council and of the auditory for all the facilities given. To the University of Valencia, our home, and especially to the Image Processing Laboratory and to the Department of Earth Physics and Thermodynamics. Special thanks to ESA and NASA for the support and sponsorship, and Airbus, ELA and Sensor for their sponsorship, and finally, and especially to the organizing committee of the RAC Symposium. I ask you for a warm applause for them. I don't want to steal any more time from our special guest. I now give the floor to the is a principal for research and science policy of the University of Valencia, Professor Pilar Campins. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Torrent Valencia. I would like to give a word introduction to the other members of the table and to the distinguished invited speakers, speakers from ISA and NASA. I would like to honor the fewer peace sellers and his legacy. Let me introduce briefly our university. The University of Valencia is an institution founded more than five centuries ago, which has become a mother public university of reference open to almost all branches of knowledge. Physics is one of our internationally recruited areas. It's a pleasure for me to be introducing this uh, five international symposium on present advances in quantitative remote sensing. Many thanks for visiting us. I hope all of you have a nice uh, visit. I want to thank to the organization, the Global Change Unit of the University of Valencia and to Professor Jose Antonio Sobrino for hosting this meeting in Valencia. I congratulate this meeting cancer to show scientific advances and to define process priorities. The meeting, as the summary indicates, is focused to assist the state of the art of both theory and application in the analysis of remote sensing data. I hope all of you have a very productive and enjoyable conference. I hope that all the aims of the meeting are reached and you find the different topics enriching. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Pilar Campins. The next speaker will be the General Director of the University of Research and Science of the Generalitat Valenciana, Josefina Buenos. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to extend you all very warm welcome on behalf of the Valencian government and welcome the participant to the fifth international symposium on research advances 
in quantitative remote sensing. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all the international participants from France, USA, Australia. Welcome to Torrent. Welcome to the University of Valencia. I hope you will enjoy your stay. The symposium will offer a unique framework to interact with members of the international remote sensing community, reinforce the networks across the international community, and at the same time enjoy the city of Valencia. I would like also to express my sincere thanks to the organizers and in particular to the chairman, Professor José Antonio Sobrino, and the organizing committee. All of them, together with the University of Valencia, have been working very hard to organize an international, complete, and diverse symposium. We truly appreciate your dedication. Finally, I wish you a delightful and fruitful day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia Wernham. It is my pleasure to give the floor to the Sue Rose from Mayor of Korea. Alguien que tenía que tocar va en castellano y ese pues soy yo. Traducirá. Bienvenidos a Torrent. Esta es nuestra casa, nuestra ciudad. Es una ciudad acogedora que cree que la diferencia enriquece, que apuesta por la ciencia y el futuro y que trabaja codo a codo con todos aquellos que creen en un mundo mejor. Traducirán, como os he dicho, la pequeña intervención. Welcome to Torrent. This is your home. Our friendly and welcoming city believes that difference is rewarding and we also support science and development and it works side by side with all those who believe in a better world. I will speak to you in Spanish while they will be translating me during my speech. No solo bienvenidos, también gracias. Gracias por convertir Torrel durante unos días en la capital de la teledetección, con lo que es, como que es lo mismo, en una referencia para el trabajo en el ámbito del medio ambiente y la tecnología. Gracias a los organizadores por esta quinta convocatoria, por su esfuerzo y trabajo. Gracias a la Universidad de Valencia por su esfuerzo en la investigación y promoción de este ámbito de la ciencia, por confiar en nuestra ciudad para, para la celebración de este evento. Gracias especialmente al profesor Sobrino por que ha querido traer a Torrent su ciudad y nuestra casa este congreso que es para nosotros una gran oportunidad. We are not only welcome, but we are also very grateful for transforming the land for a few days in a benchmark in the field of environment and technology in the capital of the remote sensing. Thank you to the organizers for making this fifth edition possible for their effort and work. Thank you as well to the University of Valencia for its sacrifice in the investigation and promotion of the science field. Furthermore, for trusting in our city and giving us the chance to become the host of this event. Thank you especially to the Professor Sorino for bringing to Torrent his hometown and our home, this Congress, which is a big opportunity for us all. Hoy estáis aquí más de 200 congresistas de más de 20 nacionalidades diferentes y estáis aquí para compartir aquello que cada uno de vosotros ha descubierto, ha avanzado y ha mejorado. Estáis aquí para compartirlo, porque sois conscientes de que el progreso no es posible sin el apoyo y la fuerza de todos. No es posible sin compartir e intercambiar para hacer más y llegar más lejos. You have come from more than 20 countries more than 200 delegates to share what you have discovered and improved. You are all here to share all your knowledge because you are very aware that everyone's support and strength 
are indispensable to make progress possible. Moving forward demands sharing and exchanging to go further. Estamos aquí para escuchar los avances más relevantes en nuestro campo de estudio. Un campo de estudio con una altísima intervención de la tecnología que trabaja como los ojos del mundo. Un mundo que se mira a sí mismo. Sois los centinelas de nuestro medio ambiente. Investigáis, controláis, medís, publicáis lo que está pasando a nuestro planeta. A nuestro planeta. Y por desgracia, muchas veces no sois escuchados. As we know, we are here to listen carefully to the most outstanding advances in your study field in which technology plays an important role. Therefore, it has become the world size, a world that looks at itself. You are the sentinels of our environment. You investigate, control, measure and publish what is happening to our planet, but unfortunate, unfortunately, you are not being listened often. Vuestro esfuerzo, el de miles y miles de personas que trabajan para diagnosticar los problemas y dar soluciones, no alcanzará su objetivo si no somos capaces de hacerlo público, de compartirlo, y que desde las instituciones, la sociedad y las empresas tomen, tomen medidas drásticas para cambiarlo. Your effort and the effort of thousands of people that work to diagnose what are the problems and find their solutions won't reach its goal unless we are able to share it. The institutions, society and enterprises should take drastic measures to make this situation change. Con vuestro esfuerzo y vuestros avances nos ayudáis a recobrar, a recobrar la confianza en la tecnología, en que la tecnología puede servir a la humanidad y al medio ambiente. With your effort and advances, you help us recover the confidence in technology that it can help the humanity and environment. Hay una falsa cita atribuida a este que realmente hace un buen diagnóstico de lo que nos ha pasado en los últimos 100 años. Dice se ha vuelto espantosamente obvio que la tecnología ha superado nuestra humanidad. Esa es por desgracia la realidad en muchos aspectos de nuestra vida, pero no aquí. Veo aquí tecnología al servicio de la humanidad, tecnología con corazón y con personas que viven y trabajan sin perder el, el objetivo último del progreso humano y la mejora del mundo. There is a quote that is wrongly attributed to Albert Einstein that in fact makes a really good diagnosis of what ha has been happening in the last hundred years and it says the following It has become shockingly obvious that technology has surpassed our humanity. Unfortunately, that's the reality in many aspects of our lives but not in this particular case. Right here, I see technology committed to humanity with passion, directed by persons that live and work without forgetting the main goal of human progress and the world's improvement. Porque la historia de la humanidad se ha hecho mirando a las estrellas, queriendo ir más allá, pero vosotros no os habéis conformado con eso. Habéis vuelto la vista atrás, y en realidad mirando desde el espacio hacia abajo, para mirar nuestro mundo y mejorar aquello que lo vemos. Desde la desertización hasta el aumento de la temperatura provocado por la sobreexplotación de recursos y la superpoblación de las ciudades, pasando por el análisis de los recursos hídricos o el agujero de ozono. No busquemos otro mundo, otras estrellas, trabajemos para no destruir el nuestro, para hacerlo mejor. Finally, we don't forget that humanity's history has been written to go further. But you haven't resigned yourself to this, and you have looked back to look at our world to improve things such as the desertification, the increase of the earth temperature due to the overexploit of our resources and the overpopulation in the cities, as well as the analysis of the hydrological resources and the ozone hole. 
Let's not look for other worlds. Let's look, let's work together not to destroy our planet, but make it better instead. Espero que este congreso sea una buena oportunidad para todos vosotros y que lo disfrutéis y que el intercambio de conocimientos sea más productivo que nunca, pero sobre todo que cuando volváis a casa el mundo haya cambiado un poco más. Muchas gracias. I hope this congress stands as a good opportunity for all of you that you enjoy it and that the exchange of knowledge becomes more fruitful, but overall that when you get home the world will have changed. Thank you very much. Satellites with 33, 36,000 kilometers above our heads, 
and we're still going strong with, a, with, a, with an evolutionary meteorological satellite program without which many of our daily operations in terms of traffic, transport, tourism and planning uh, would not be possible did we have the satellite supported weather forecast. Here a quick glimpse on our uh, Earth Explorer satellites, our innovators in space, um, four of them have been, four of those missions have been launched so far. Let me start with the famous Ferrari in space, uh, uh, the gravity and uh, steady state ocean circulation mission, uh, Goche, which with three pairs of cubed titanium masses hovering in an electrical field, were measuring the gravity field of the Earth to an unprecedented accuracy. And what you see here indeed, as opposed to what you know as a globus at home, this is the real Earth, the real planet we live on in terms of its marine geoid, which means that is the Earth gravity with the oceans at rest without any tidal or wind or storm forcing. And if these, uh, this gravity field was underlying all geodetic reference frames as it is today also for the navigation tools that we have on our mobile phones here, if we had that at the time when the Brits and the French were dugging the channel under the Strait of Dover, they wouldn't have missed each other by just 40 centimeters, but they would have spot on. So there is a lot of application which are becoming a lot more precise uh, with those marine geoid references and gravity field. But there are also sometimes serendipitous results we get from these explorer missions, like for instance here, where Gorcha, because of gravity field variations, is able to get a very good three-dimensional structure of crust and mantle, pointing towards higher or lower compaction of sedimentary rocks and potential deposits of oil and gas, of hydrocarbon deposits. And together with the seismic stairs measurements that we have and geophysical models that we have, these high-resolution global coverage gravity field differences enable us um, to support uh, the prospection and the exploration of uh, hydrocarbon resources as they have not been possible so far. And we get these kind of fantastic results and they are improving as we go on and, and we increase uh, our uh, data uh, vaults there. Uh, Goche has been deorbited because we tried to get more and more accuracy by flying lower and lower at the end of uh, 2013. Uh, launched in 2010 was another star at the sky of our Earth Explorers, the Soil Moisture and Ocean Salinity Mission SMOS, trying to measure two of the holy grails of climate science, soil moisture and sea surface salinity. SMOS uh, measures passive microwave uh, radiation emerging from the Earth by means of a, a, a three-pronged antenna which applies an interferometric image processing where it measures this LDAP radiometry and gets a fantastic lowdown on the ever increasing importance of sea surface salinity which is constantly changing due to the increasing melt that comes from glaciers and, and, and ice caps in Greenland. So you see these salinity patterns in the ocean here paired also with global soil moisture fields that meanwhile are also used by um, agricultural services like, for instance, the U.S. Department of Agriculture that is using the small soil moisture data in order to run its models, particularly also over drought stricken areas. But also with SMOS, we made serendipitous results we didn't count on before because whirling winds, tornadoes, uh, storm tracks, hurricanes, um, they mess up the ocean surface to the extent that it has an impact on the brightness temperature that comes up in passive microwave. And SMOS was able to track this hurricane Igor. I'm told that back home in Esrin, where I come from, we also have already data over Hurricane Irma, but the time was too short to have them processed and bring them to you. Also launched in 2010 was our Cryosat uh, radar altimeter, not a conventional radar altimeter as we had them so far on ERS and NVSAT uh, satellites or Topex Poseidon. This is a satellite that applies an altimetric synthetic aperture uh, as well as an interferometric technique with the two antennae you see here in order to be able to measure the freeboard, the floating ice um, on the surface of our polar oceans in order to show not only what the coverage change of ice is, but particularly the thickness of the ice mass. And that points towards the rapidly uh, declining ice in the Arctic um, 
and, and not so much, but also beginning in, in the Antarctic, uh, telling, you know, making scientists now uh, change their opinion that we won't have an ice-free Arctic summer by the end of the century, but already by 2040 to 2050, as it looks like, which is highly alerting. Now these explorer satellites, if I've just shown them to you, they are often not working alone in isolation. If we pair them with the information from our operational Sentinel satellites, such as here from Sentinel-1 synthetic aperture radar, which is imaging, we are able to show fantastic phenomena like the flexing ice shelf of the Pine Island Glacier in Antarctica, which is washed out from underneath with a receding grounding line, a phenomenon that you don't see if you are looking downward with an imager. You wouldn't see the flexing that we do observe using radar interferometry that shows morphological changes from Sentinel-1 and the absolute altitude change of this flexing ice sheet from Cryosat. That gave us a clue that uh, this grounding line has been retreating over 20 years for more than 40 kilometers and has uh, thinned by 200 meters. These are hidden changes in our environment which are very important and it also is a nice example of the cooperation of operational and exploratory satellites. When it comes to radar altimetry, there is a very important point uh, to be made and that is that it's the radar altimeters that have in combination combining the US altimeters, the French altimeters and the ESA altimeters to an undisputable finding, an irrefutable fact that is that the sea level is rising with about at the rate of 3.1 millimeter per year and that over the last uh, 25 years we've almost uh, had a sea, experienced a sea level rise of close to 8 centimeters. And for climate skeptics, whoever they are, wherever they are, this is a fact that cannot be discussed away. The latest launched uh, Earth Explorer mission, the SWARM mission, is addressing the Earth's magnetic field. Also here, unprecedented accuracy and global coverage is aspired. And after collecting three and a half years of data, I show you here the magnetic field of the Earth, and I'm not talking about the 90% magnetic field that comes from the outer core of the molten outer core, which is responsible for 90%. What I show you here are the residual 6% magnetic field in, um, in the upper crust uh, and mantle of solidifying magnetized rocks after the lava cooled down. And it gives a very nice clue about the magnetic fields and you see some uh, highly red uh, anomalies in here, like for instance um, over the Central African um, uh, Congo, where scientists believe that this anomaly may stem from a huge meteorite that uh, impacted 540 million years ago and causes this magnetic anomaly. What we also see from Swarm is an accelerating magnetic pole. The magnetic pole has never been as close to the geographic pole as it is now, but it's wandering at about 40 kilometers per year, indicating that um, polar flip, an inversion, north pole becoming south, south pole becoming north, uh, being imminent. Usually we have those changes every 400,000 years, as paleomagnetism shows us, paleomagnetology, but this time we haven't had a polar split for 700,000 years and uh, it's supposed to come in geological terms soon. Now, looking a little bit out into the future, what are the next Earth Explorer satellites to come? We're looking forward to the launch of a very complicated system called EOS. It's a LiDAR uh, sensor that is supposed to measure the speed and the vector of winds in the upper atmosphere, followed 2019 by EarthCare, a four-payload mission, which also involves our colleagues from JAXA in Japan to measure the influence of clouds and aerosols onto our radiation budget, and uh, in 2021, a synthetic aperture P-band radar, long wavelength, in order to measure the above-ground biomass, particularly above our uh, tropical forests and in 2022 and there is a lot of, of, of brain power has gone into that from uh, the University of Valencia into the FLEX mission which is a fluorescence mission where the satellite measures fluorescence signals indicating the health and state of our vegetation and crops long before any stress can influence the plant. So some very very uh, challenging missions on the way ahead quickly changing here to our operational satellite program, the, uh, the Sentinels. 
Um, we have already uh, five sentinels in space, the radar satellite Sentinel-1 in two units, Sentinel-1A and B, the optical imaging system Sentinel-2, which follows the philosophy of the American Landsat or US Landsat and the French spot. Also, A and B have been launched, Sentinel-B on 7th of March of this year, Sentinel-3A, which is an oceanographic satellite, which follows the footsteps of Envisat, um, Sentinel-B is prone to be launched in spring next year. And then a bit further out we have Sentinel-4s and 5s, which are atmospheric chemistry satellites mainly addressing air quality. And finally Sentinel-6, which and that's a nice example also, which is trying to translate what used to be an exploratory altimetric mission into operational use. Important to make is the point that the data that these sentinels within Copernicus acquired are free and open. They have a free and open data policy and they can be um, accessed unencumbered. We are coordinating the space component for the Commission and we have secured an infrastructure that is in place until 2030. The funding for the operations at this point in time we have until 21, but we hope, of course, that that's going to be extended. Now, when we talk about big data, massive data, and the increasing availability of data, I would like to draw your attention to those two curves. Whilst we had a steady increase of the data usage by the science community with respect to the Explorer mission, we almost see a viral explosion of the Sentinel data that, that come online and that are being used. By July of this year, we had almost 60,000 registered users, and uh, we are increasing. Uh, we are increasingly downloading data, which are going in above 10 terabyte per day. Now, some of you may be asking, do we need all this, and what is the economic and the market uh, um, angle of all that? And, and here, uh, not only Price Waterhouse and Cooper, but also other marketing institutions have checked the market a little bit and guessed that the 27 billion US dollars that the geospatial market was valued two years ago might triple by the end of this decade. And another story basically tells us that uh, every euro invested by taxpayers uh, money into the space infrastructure that we at ESA have will yield 10 euros of direct or indirect societal benefit. Now, I just wanted to give you a short glimpse about one of those services, and it's a bit high level, but it shows you the service that the European Commission is running for a land service. Uh, we talk here about wetlands, distinguishing the different tidal flats, marshlands uh, associated with the Ramsar Convention, artificial seal surfaces for city planning, for urban planning, and for industrial planning. Um, the water body delineation and mapping and monitoring should support uh, water management on land as well as forest management is aided uh, by the data that are able to distinguish the different needle broadly forest, forest types, the health of forest, as well as in agricultural areas, the different irrigated, non-irrigated, drought-stricken types, and then finally, last but not least, the different crop types that can be harvested and that are being super, super, supervised, but also in terms of certification as the European Commission demands. Um, at this point in time, we're also talking, and I had a quick chat with Jose Moreno earlier this morning, we're also talking about the becoming of an agricultural service that will uh, be working together alongside the non-monitoring service, which is very interesting, so there is a lot of demand. I cannot go through all the services, I don't have time, but I wanted to show you a little bit the, one of the emergency services that the European Commission is running and uh, in there we're talking about flooding and the near real-time availability of Sentinel-1 data showing the most neurologic points in flood-stricken areas pre and also during a flooding and post-flooding where these data in near real-time given to civil protection are able to make a big difference and to help. Another example is um, data from Sentinel-1 in interferometric mode which show uh, the Nepal earthquake of a 7.8 magnitude on the Richter scale in April 2015 where the Indian plate has been subduced or shoved underneath the Eurasian plate lifting it up uh, by 80 centimeters and causing, uh, or by one meter and, and, and causing a two meter tilt in the falls. It's very nicely visualized here. So we more and more get very, very quantitative um, with also our Earth, uh, not explorers, but uh, sentinels. If you, we are not only talking about monetary pictures 
of what our environment and our planet shows us. But if we really would dig back into our archives and we go to the US satellite CSAT, which was launched in 1978, if I'm not mistaken, the first synthetic aperture radar satellite in space, we are meanwhile able to make climate time scale suspicious time series of over 36 years at the example of um, the Greenland glacier and, and its retreat here, which is actually very nice and more and more important as we go along to show the change with these data that we have. To show you that everybody can download data, uh, we've just done this in Esri, a, a quick download of um, an, an outbreak of uh, uh, Etna on the 16th of March, five data sets just pulled down and also with the available processing tools online you can make such a time series yourself, it's very easy and it shows you the dynamics. I have to, after showing Sentinel-1 and 2, also of course show a combination of Sentinel-2 and 3 and this is in the Benguela upwelling, the western coast of Africa where we use uh, this um, ocean and land imaging instrument OSI um, to look at productivity in the ocean for, um, uh, uh, for fish farming. Uh, here we had a harmful toxic algae bloom in the Sardana Bay uh, where all the shellfish harvesting was stopped after it was unearthed that there is a, a toxic harmful algae available, the so-called HAP. And that's quite interesting. We show the bigger context with Sentinel-3 also with the spectrometric and radiometric fidelity and with Sentinel-2 we zoom in. I couldn't come, as always, to Valencia without showing um, uh, an image of the Iberic Peninsula. And this is one of the very first Sentinel-3 images which was uh, acquired on the 1st of March of last year. And it shows not only in southern Spain, you see here the dynamics uh, near the Strait of Gibraltar with upwelling uh, phytoplankton as well as suspended sediment, but you also see the vegetation um, dynamics. So that's uh, a very nice image that we have here. This is where we are with Sentinel 1 to 3, 4 and 5 are supposed to be launched in the coming years for air quality, but we're thinking about the future and that's how I'm looking forward. With Sentinel 7 we are trying to finally add what's long been overdue a CO2 atmospheric chemistry monitoring mission with Sentinel 8, a thermal imager which is supposed to complement the Landsat but also the SPOT and Sentinel-2 series with the thermal infrared capacity. Sentinel-9 is supposed to continue what we've done exploratory-wise with passive and active microwaves over the polar areas. And last but not least, the mission we all have long been striving for, which is Sentinel-10, a hyperspectral mission. Only one slide very briefly to tell you that also with the meteorological, you may remember our third strand, the outer ring uh, series of satellites, where as of 2007 we've complemented the ever-improving spatial and spectral resolution from our geostationary satellites, from our meteosats, with a polar um, mission series called METOP. Meanwhile, we are studying the third generation MTG of Meteosat and also the second generation of METOPS with additional instruments, lightning flash detectors and also increasing spatial and spectral resolution. And both of those new generations uh, cells supersede the current ones in the next decade. Not only are we developing spacecraft and launch them, we also try to get a handle and hold of our archives and reprocess and uh, produce for essential climate variables, as you see them here, long-term data sets. We're not only doing this with ESA data, we're also trying to get hold of other data from the US, from Japan and uh, also national data that we're trying to bring together for long-term uh, aerosols, uh, sea ice coverage, soil moisture, sea surface temperature, 13 variables we are studying at the moment for which we make long-term series and our delegations in Europe have at the last ministerial in Lucerne last December given us another 80 million for the second phase of this climate change initiative for which you see an example here we are starting with Skiamaki and Enrisa from back in the early 2000s we are trying um, to uh, lead further with data sets from OCO, with data sets from GOSAT, from the US and Japan, respectively, uh, greenhouse gas evolution, as in this case, for CO2. This, of course, is all very important, and you see here the Sustainable Development Goals portrayed on the UN building in New York, 
for um, uh, the sustainable development goals and its, its um, uh, 169 targets. And because ESA is in a close engagement with the scientific and operational user community, the implementation of the Paris Goals and the pursuance of the sustainable development work against the sustainable development goals is already now driving our program. But things are changing, things are changing rapidly. We are talking about big data, we are talking about cloud processing, we are talking about data analytics and a market trend that is increasing. Now, uh, Google bought Terabella from Skybox and sold it to Planet and uh, RapidEye and Dove constellations are being launched. MDA bought Digital Globe and there are more and more entrepreneurs uh, on the scene and we ask ourselves, should we react, should we as agency adapt, what do we have to do? This little animation shows you the setting free of 104 satellites from PSLV in February of this year. Never ever have as many Earth observation satellites been launched at the same time. Okay, they don't have the precision, they don't have the swath, they don't have the resolution of our current classical satellites, but things are changing rapidly. And with this paradigm shift, we have in a way to adapt. And um, our director, Josef Aschbacher, he's basically trying to drive us and is pursuing new avenues to take full account of this paradigm shift. And we are aiming for a swift implementation not only of our explorer, of our groundbreaking explorers, but we're also trying to maintain the pace of the program and initiate industry by stimulating them to build also smaller and faster satellites and to adopt a fail-fast approach where you don't pursue an avenue when you realize that you can't make it. The other thing we are counting on, besides exponential technologies that we're trying to do with you, is also take account of the global availability of formation flying, constellation and convoys. With our partner with NASA in the US, we have working groups that are trying to pursue this and make uh, this one of the elements, one of the ingredients of our future. We have now just founded a new department in ESA ESRIN, our Earth Observation Center, which is called the Fee Department, where we are trying to establish a think tank with visiting scientists, uh, with also industry elements to try and be a little bit swifter and a little bit faster. And if you see that brain that's there, I hope we all share the same aspirations that we are trying to be part of this paradigm shift and not only look downward but also forward. With this I close and I thank you very, very much for the opportunity of having been able to present and thanks for your attention. Good morning, everyone, and thank you. And it's a pleasure to follow the previous presentation. Uh, I'm somewhat embarrassed because the United States is, is intending to withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement, which I think is a tragic mistake, but hopefully it will only be a short interruption from 
our goal of one planet, one people, one future, we're all in this together. And that's what my presentation will show. It's a presentation which Pierce Sellers and I put together. Pierce Sellers uh, of NASA was the Earth Science Champion in the United States. He was a British citizen and an American citizen. He unfortunately passed away just before Christmas of last year. Uh, but he and I, he lived in my basement. We've been friends ever since he came to the U.S. in 1982. After he became an astronaut, he lived in my basement in Washington, D.C., and then bought the house next door. We socialized together and we worked together. When he lived in my basement, uh, he told people if I raised his rent, uh, as my boss, he would cut my salary. So when we negotiated how much money I, he should pay for rent, I said, well, what do you think? He said, how about $1,000 a month, you asked. And I said, I can't believe you said that. That's ridiculous. How about $300 a month? Anyway, so we negotiated to $500 a month, but I paid for all the beer and wine. <laughs> so Pierre Sellers and I and many people realized that with satellites, we can measure geophysical variables in the Earth. These are really important. It's the geophysical variables we measure. It's from Earth orbit. We have observations every day, day after day after day, year after year, and we can therefore study climate by these geophysical variables, and I'll show several of them, which are directly linked to many of the abiotic and biotic variables of, on our planet. The second thing which is very important is, is geophysical observations are important, but when they are combined with numerical simulation models, they become very, very important because we can run these models forward in time, backward in time to verify their accuracy, and this is extremely important. This is all made possible by the satellite revolution which started with the launch of Sputnik. Here's a picture of Piers in space. He was also a Explorer. Uh, it's my honor to be uh, uh, to share the program of a Pedro of the Spanish astronaut colleague of Piers, who's with us today. This is a picture of Piers on his STS-121 mission, where he lost a spatula in space. Uh, this became space debris. He told people it was his favorite spatula. He was very sorry to lose it. Uh, we accused him of launching an anti-satellite weapon. Uh, through his carelessness. Anyway, here's Piers in space. Uh, from the International Space Station, this are some images which are recorded. Uh, we can see city lights and we can see lightning flashes. Uh, and then this will make the transition into looking at the aurora borealis. So the vantage point of space, whether it be from Earth orbiting satellites, from the International Space Station, and it is an International Space Station. You have the ability to observe many, many phenomena. It's truly remarkable. And Piers said every time he was in space, it was hard to sleep because he wanted to observe the Earth. Piers understood the interaction of the land surface with the atmosphere. This was his specialty in, in numerous publications that have been cited hundreds of times. Uh, and he also understood the interaction of the ocean with the atmosphere in our couple atmosphere, ocean, land, surface, world. So here's an image taken by the Apollo 8 astronauts uh, on Christmas of 1968, showing the Earth. For the first time, this photograph made people realize the Earth is really isolated. Out of more than, than two trillion galaxies, which we know from the Hubble Space Telescope, exist in our universe, we only know of one habitable planet, and we are on it, and we're here today. It's our stewardship of this planet which is important, and photographs like this from space from 1968 set the stage for realizing the finiteness of the Earth and the importance to protect it. So these are some of the things which we need to deal with. One is Earth science, the other is climate change, Climate is changing, it's caused by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. I do not understand how any climate change denier can argue against the sea level rise data, which were previously shown, or the uh, gravity data from the uh, German American Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, or GRACE. 
There are many security issues which are very important, uh, which earth science provides data to assess what's changing and where. There are also more, more there are morality issues, and uh, Pope Francis has expressed these in a very, very clear and unequivocal way. And we're all very fond of Papa Francesco. Uh, and uh, Pierce made us read the papal encyclical of Pope Francis. This translates into policy, uh, and this is one of the reasons we have to work in a united way, because it's one planet. Here is an image of Earth taken uh, a few days ago from the Discover satellite. Unfortunately, the Trump administration wants to turn off the views of Earth from this satellite. I don't understand that. Now here is a visualization of largely NASA's satellites as they are with the Earth. The point here is we have many satellites from NASA, from ESA, from other countries which are orbiting the Earth. This is why a free exchange of data is very important, so these data can be complementary and combined. Here is another visualization of, of meteorological data, atmospheric sounding and precipitation measurements from several different satellites. And it's extremely important for improving numerical weather forecasting that satellite data be assimilated into our weather models. And that is what these data provide. And you'll notice this gets denser and denser as, as more observations accumulate. All, most of our advances in numerical weather prediction have come from the assimilation of satellite data coupled to the advancement of numerical simulation models to finer and finer spatial resolutions. So you see, as we go on, things get very, very dense with all of these observations. We also have been studying sea surface temperature from satellites since on the launch of NOAA-6 in 1978, and continuing through the present, there are now many satellites from different countries which are viewing and reporting sea surface temperature data and how this changes day by day, week by week, decade by decade. This is a multi-scale representation of sea surface temperature from, from the 1st of January of 2010 through the end of 2011. And you get to see the dynamics over this time period of two years and how, and just what a dynamic Earth we live on with respect to sea surface temperature. It's also important to study the salinity of the upper portion of the ocean. Uh, these are data from Aquarius, which unfortunately only occupy from 2011, or only operated from 2011 through 2014. What you see is some portions of our ocean are very saline. This is where you have a lot of evaporation. In some areas, other areas are less saline. This is where you have glacial melt uh, and or a lot of precipitation of the water. Uh, but the sea surface salinity is a very important climate variable which needs to be measured. And I'm very glad that from the SMOS instruments we're able to continue this. This is one of my favorite models to look at. These are modeled data uh, where you have assimilated satellite data and you're able to look at the circulation of the oceans. And you see just what a dynamic ocean we have. And this is one of the most spectacular images or, or visualizations I've ever seen. I find it very fascinating. You can see gyres as they form. You can also see how when, uh, when Christopher Columbus through support from the Spanish monarchy in 1492, when he departed from the Canary Islands, where else could he go but to the New World? It just would take him right across, which it did. Now we also have a lot of data which are very useful from the gravity recovery and climate experiment. These data started in 2003, and they show a lot of information about climate and about the water cycle. This is a representation of these data, a mapping of these data on April the 11th, 
11 of 2016, showing where you have, relative to the great record, depletions of groundwater in the brown colors. And the blue colors are where you have an increase in groundwater from the great state of. Data like these are extremely important because groundwater storage is very important for irrigation. And irrigation is eminently tied in many areas, as we know, to crop production. Now, the incorporation of satellite data into numerical simulation models of the planet is really important. This is a representation from the Goddard Space Flight Center uh, GEOS 5 model. And what the incorporation of satellite data into numerical simulation climate models and weather models now permits you to do is, to, is as you get to finer spatial resolutions, you can improve the physics dramatically because you can resolve, for example, individual clouds. This has been revolutionary in improving the use and predictions of numerical weather models. Uh, recently, uh, two years ago, there, uh, with Hurricane Katrina in the United States, uh, it was observed that the European Center for Medium Range Forecast did much better than NOAA within uh, the United States in, in predicting the course of the hurricane. And the reason for it, simply stated, was our friends in NOAA with their weather prediction models were assimilating advanced very high resolution radiometer data, whereas the European Center for Medium, for Medium Range Forecast were assimilating MODIS data. So better data leads to better uh, representations of, of weather, and run forwards and backwards in time to climate. These are some great data superimposed upon the Arctic, showing how you can use gravity data to look at the loss of mass directly from ice sheets. And the ice sheets we're concerned with are, of course, Greenland, and then especially in Antarctica, there is 10, approximately 10 times more ice on land in Antarctica than, than is the case in Greenland. With the GRACE data, we can quantify the melting of ice sheets uh, in direct mass terms. And we can also then tell, with respect to sea level, what component of sea level rise is due to thermal expansion and what component is due to the melting of ice. This is another representation of the ice mass loss from Greenland. As we go through time, you can see in the lower right-hand corner, the time is indicated. Uh, and as, as time progresses, you see you have this progressively greater ice mass loss around the periphery of Greenland. It was mentioned about sea level. Whenever I argue with climate change deniers, and I do so frequently, I always mention, first of all, sea level rise that if sea level is rising, the planet is warming. If sea level is falling, the planet is cooling. It's unambiguous and it's very straightforward. And this is why the Topex, the Poseidon, Jason data are so important. This has been a joint European and American undertaking. But the sea level rise data, uh, and as it, as it was mentioned, that the signal of the rise is on the order of, of 3.2 millimeters per year. These are unequivocal representations that our planet is warming. So therefore, climate change is real. Facts and theory support it unequivocally with no questions. Thus, there's enough information to justify action. And the climate change deniers and their associates have lost the argument. And they've lost the argument because of satellite geophysical variables of our planet. So what about climate change? It's an ecological problem. It's an economic problem. It's a social problem. It is a security problem because it will displace large populations of people. And this will lead to security issues. And it is a moral problem. Now, the, the U.S. military, whether you think about them in positive or negative terms, recently stated, you never have 100% certainty on, in any conflict. 
if you have to wait until you have 90% certainty, something bad is going to happen to you. The same argument should be applied to climate change. And it's ironic that the U.S. military has been a steadfast supporter of NASA's efforts and international efforts to study climate. I mentioned before about Pope Francis, we respect and admire and encourage a continuation of his moral arguments to address climate change. And as I said, Chris Sellers made all of the senior scientists at the Goddard Space Flight Center, of which I'm the, the senior biospheric science, scientist, read his papal encyclical. And I, and I personally found it very interesting. So we have reasons to be cheerful. The international community is mobilized. We have successfully dealt with the depletion of stratospheric ozone based upon science. And we know from current measurements and from model predictions that the ozone depletion will stabilize and will recover by the, by the middle of the next century. So that's very good. Earth science is important. With satellites, we measure geophysical variables, but we have to couple these to numerical simulation models. So by doing so, we collectively, people from all countries, can figure this out together. Free and open data is a huge undertaking on the part of NASA and on the part of ESA now, and we applaud this because people can use these data to study the planet. We can figure this out. Uh, because of our geophysical variables and our numerical simulation models. So I will stop there and then would like to share the podium uh, with a colleague of, of Piers, is from the, from the astronaut program. Uh, I will let him introduce himself, but it's my pleasure to be here with Pedro uh, in this presentation. And um, 
and he was he was uh, pierced in the middle. Uh, and one of the things that we immediately remarked is uh, he was uh, the most cheerful person that that we had uh, met. Uh, most of us, we were we were all smiling in this because uh, we were supposed to smile, but. Uh, but yes, uh, Piers was the one, the only one who kept the smile for his whole life. So here's uh, two younger fellows and starting their astronaut career. And yes, he became astronaut and he started training with all of us. And this was Piers all the time. Piers was always cheering people up. Piers was always uh, the great. Uh, brain with uh, two or three crack jokes just about to crack from it at every, every, every single event and he always had the, the wit to make jokes about everything and here's uh, he will helping somebody get into his blood suit and then uh, some um, years later after uh, after lots of uh, training and preparation, he managed to fly in space. And he is uh, here with the crew flying in space for the first time. You will hear, you will see him uh, next to uh, one shorter member of the crew with a with a moustache. You will see in some other pictures. And here he flew again for the second time. And here he flew again for the third time. And during all this time, Pierce was with us, and he was training with us, and he was he started like uh, like he had started his life the day he arrived to us, and we never knew that he was uh, such a accomplished uh, scientist, and he had done so much, so many other things in his previous life, because he was always trying to well blend <coughs> into the cheerful. Uh, I don't even know, probably maybe maybe uh, some of the. American uh, members know what they're trying to mean by this. This seem to be letters that I have no idea. But there was always this kind of uh, this kind of cheerful environment in every flight of peers. Probably that was uh, also because of him. He is he would during the academy in the space station. He was voting with his uh, timeline and plans. Always like that, which was also. A very positive but towards work. So uh, work always happened uh, more efficiently uh, in the in the environment that that Piers created uh, socially. Around him. Here's one of those uh, nice uh, big nose uh, pictures that we took. So there was Don Pettit and and Piers and me were the three people with big noses in the class, and we never had a problem taking our pictures from that side. Always a cheerful moment in every flight that Pierce undertook. I don't know why this is kind of trembling, this is probably a Microsoft effect. But that's, that's basically the idea that I wanted to transmit. That for us, Pierce was one of us, and we knew he had been working in the Earth Observation, but just they did, we didn't, we didn't know. Uh, how much merit he had. And always the Earth. Looking at the Earth from up there, taking the, the picture that he thought would be significant for science, probably. And we didn't know about it. I thought, we thought he was, just, he was just taking pretty pictures. And he was uh, uh, also um, entrusted with uh, one of the most complicated works uh, kind of work that we have to do in the in the space station that is the space box. And here he is with uh, with Fyodor joking well always joking if you know Pierce in the space station just about to get in there and always a cheerful photo. And there he was a scientist Entrusted with uh, flying space and, uh, and doing extravehicular activities, uh, that's uh, that, that was a completely second career for for Pierce, a totally different uh, 
set of activities that he that he uh, undertook with, uh, of course, the most the, a very joyful spirit. But uh, I'm, I'm sorry about the jerky that, that this is doing. Imagine, imagine being up there for a meteorologist and, and uh, earth scientist. I can imagine that it was very difficult to accomplish the technical work and not try to always look at the earth and see what's happening down there. Always looking at the earth. But very complex technical work that he also accomplished very well and he was entrusted with uh, six different uh, EDAs in his, uh, in his two first flights. Uh, that actually did a lot of uh, did a lot to uh, uh, advance the, the putting together the space station. And uh, of course, for a meteorologist, you cannot have a better view from work than mm -hmm. this. But only peers managed that as a meteorologist. He was a greatly accomplished astronaut and uh, mostly. A very good friend of all of us. Hundreds of and hundreds of people declare themselves as being the friends of Peter Sellers. Uh, because he always showed friendship friendship to everybody. Of course, uh, not all of us can uh, can claim to have such a long history as uh, Jim Tucker in the, in the break. You can ask him more anecdotes about Peter Sellers. And uh, we were very happy to have Peter with us. One other aspect of Peter is that he was always ready to help. And this is pictures of Peter of helping uh, the um, uh, other uh, disadvantaged people or people with diseases that come to NASA in what they call the Make-A-Wish uh, program. And here you see with the children and always dedicating much more time than, than he had for, for uh, the people who came asking for any help, including these children. Oh, and here's Fyodor again. Fyodor <laughs> was um, with uh, Piers in what was the first flight for Fyodor and for Piers 15 years ago, and they got quite close in there. And I took the opportunity that Fyodor was in the space station just a couple of weeks ago, three. And I asked him, Fyodor, do you want to send any messages from the Congress? Because for the Congress, because we are going to we are going to uh, remember peers. And uh, he spoke for like eight or nine, nine minutes. I've never seen such a long message. But this is just an excerpt. That doesn't work. Okay, so we need to get out of Microsoft. Just one more pair with me because I'd like to see the other thing. Is it sure? It's really sorry because it's uh, the speech about remembrance by friend, by big friend, with big soul, Pierce Sellers. And the first of all, why we are staying here? Because just a little less than 15 years ago, we walked together. It was our first flight. It was first flight for Pierce, my first flight. 
Ed Pierce was one of great men, great human in our world, for what reason? So I continued in Russia. Я крайне редко встречал людей с таким огромным сердцем, с таким желанием помочь кому-то еще, с таким пониманием, что такое мужчина в этой жизни. Потому что надо было видеть, как он относится к своей семье, к своим детям. Одна из крайних фотографий, которую он мне прислал, к сожалению, незадолго до его смерти, это фотография с его внука. Он был очень счастлив. Ну, как вам сказать, конечно, я понимаю, что он умер, но уверен, что его душа вокруг этой планеты, и в том числе на станции. Персик, мы тебя любили, мы тебя продолжаем любить.
developed uh, projects. And the presentation will be given by Jean Louis Robotien from Meteor France.
by Agro Product. So we have an enabled product to different banks, and we have a product integrated uh, over one bank to, uh, to run certain visual community needs and uh, with the burden for it and, and short wave or so on. So the modeling is very simple. It's classical. You assume that one pixel can be separated to different uh, elementic uh, photographic components. One is an inversion, one is geometric effect, and one is volume scattering, plus a snow, a snow kernels. So it's kind of kernels, and you have an inner relationship between the different components. Snow kernels are not implemented yet, it's still in, in development. It opens the specular effect, in particular the, <coughs> the effect of uh, scattering and forward, forward reaction this is particularly What's important? That's a recurrent question, the product. So we have one product every 10 days, but of course, uh, this is synthesis, we need to accumulate information. So, so the window of the uh, composite window is uh, 20 days. So after 20 days, we make the product. How does it work? So during the 20 day period, we select all piercings and we make an average of this piercing. I mean, uh, after processing by the DADF modeling. And what's important before in most projects, you have, uh, for the product, you have the date of the file name. Here you have another layer, which is the edge, which is the pixel per day, the edge of the product as a median value of the clear pixel used to make uh, the product. Also, uh, one, I mean, it's a new international sensor, we are very aware of the user needs, you have, they have to, they like to have gap fill data. So the gap filling data, we use a recurrent uh, algorithm from uh, starting from previous information and we give a weight to a temporary weight function for a consumer process and if you have to let I understand you give 10% to the recurrent uh, product in case you have a new product if you have not new product, you use uh, the product for the, for the previous day. And of course if you increase the time, I mean, the time component characteristic, you can increase the smoothness of the product which is not suitable because you want to detect uh, some uh, elementary things. About the, so the, the output variables, they are in HDF file format. Uh, they could be probably in SDF sooner or later. And then you can hear albedo and you can hear you can talk R. So we have the HNM factor reflectance or be the HNM factor reflectance. What's interesting, you have an error associated with an error bar, which is uncertainty as it the way we made the product. You have a point to flag and we have the ZH. So that's quite similar for top R with different, uh, with different maps. Quite different, that's very really important why if you want to assimilate the data. So we have majority rules that we follow the same strategies and models that over a complete period we select pixels as no free or free or no pixels and we make an available product for no free or no, so we don't mix it all together. We use a clear information, so this uh, the information is given to the user and we have this no or no no uh, but no, so of course, I mean, uh, we don't have uh, thermal bath, so this is a real difficulty. And we found out uh, with Vito that we have residue in the uh, old version, we have uh, not the new version, we have a residue uh, uh, cloud, I mean, it's no flag in uh, when we do no expect, like in, in Spain in June, of course, and you cannot explain it, especially in Castilla, a month, you don't expect. And actually, it's, that's, uh, there is some little uh, uh, tuning that we done, and if you uh, just apply a, a temporal filter, you can, um, based on the temporal persistence analysis, you can see that if you assume that you don't have this information of two consecutive days, two pixels in time, or you filter, you see you almost everything after three pixel, uh, I mean, filter, special detector for time components, you can actually, uh, I mean, almost remove all pixels. But, okay, that's something which is. Uh, has to be sold officially. So that's the reason why uh, there is a announcement, uh, a kind of one robin, who has cloud detection one robin exercise, is proposed to the user community where you can apply your own uh, processing for removal of the cloud or, because there is too much holistic cloud. And this is, I think, still open uh, open uh, exercise if you want to participate to, to judge this, uh, uh, this, uh, this cross sharing exercise. Uh, some of this about the products, so about the page, so I think it's very uh, are close to, the, uh, close to the conference, so you, if you have some time you can check, you can go with the slides and check. So there are mostly crops here in the area, so the flower, the same as barracks, 
and we crafted the panel, it seems to be a nice area, a mountain area, and we uh, salaire the squeeze out, I don't know if you say it correctly, and you can find also the cost to the sea, you can find also some cost. So, if you look at time series of this top car, uh, different bands for this size, you can say that's a consistent time series. And if you look at the PR, for instance, for this area, it's pretty flat for Porten de Palas, it's a natural grassland. But if you look at the crop in Salia Suiza, you say that the fact you take into account to the head effect here, also, that we should take, there is a shift in time for NDVR, and this is something really we, I mean, we desire as a user to say NDVR is a time component and shaping and has to be correctly captured. So this has an effect of uh, the edge. And if you know the sites are many also there is crop, also the effect of the edge is visible in the, on the NDVR, which is a really uh, interesting aspect. This is to be verified with one uh, network measurement, and there is, uh, I mean, we need to have possibly validation. But, uh, at least there is matter to be uh, But uh, also correction, that's another issue. Uh, so far there is no really, I mean, we use uh, good stematology. And we did an understand, we compare uh, new real time how they move from all this with uh, how they from Copernicus and also they go into a service, the same as global service for atmosphere. And uh, we say that uh, this is very promising because this is a new real time available product. And the impact of using a model instead of satellite for IOS correction, there is less impact so far, so it's something we need to go deeper into that to, to make the quite proper selection. And the analytic bias, and probably you can read it, it's about 1%, so it's not negligible, but that's very really interesting. So there is an option for IOS correction will be, will be undertaken, will be, will be an, an important decision. Another important decision is about uh, using, I mean, we can use VRD uh, modeling, we can use sky or gas sky to do the inversion. This is another design, you can use this component by, uh, of base of aerosol uh, optical depth, and after the risk, we find there was a little effect, take no out or I mean, because it's a diffuse or non-diffuse, and the effect is uh, about 0.02%, so it's a very large effect in doing that, so I don't know. About uh, radiation, but now what is this? My work for my colleague from the OLAB. So OLAB they try to pick up the most I mean consistent uh, ground, I mean selection of ground based network but based on some criteria. Uh, one is the uh, distance to open water body. We like to work upon water body and uh, change the reflectance that could have an impact on the measurement. Another is about the minimal fraction of majority of land cover. Another one is land cover majority, another one is vertical range of distance of 5 km, another one about location in latitude. So after that, we were, uh, after this uh, sunshine selection, we were about, about uh, a little less at 800 uh, selection of uh, confidence site. And most of them, they are distributed uh, all around the world. So, comparing the blue band, so this map of the blue band, so the consistent uh, maps of uh, blue, uh, reflectance, air blue and ZF, the error bar are very really, uh, quite important in February because of course uh, we have we lack of uh, from key information. So we need to accumulate information with time. So this increase, I mean the uncertainty of the data, so it's just a question is not the way we make physics the point the way that we don't miss of information. And we put uh, uncertainty because the product uh, date is uh, dated for several weeks before. That's something is we cannot do that, we do not we do not have clear information that's a problem. If you need infrared band, another distance, that's another date in May, where you have good information, this error bar is very weak, and that edge also is very weak in this case, it's about a few days. So we have more confidence in the product, and there is good special consistency in the product. Three band, another date, still in uh, summer, and also we found the same thing as the same conclusion as the infrared. We have a good uh, special distribution of the product. We have a good uh, consistency in the error and good consistency in the dead edge uh, of the product, the edge of the product. You can see some area that is increased probably by cloud cover or some mountain area in general. We have more uncertainty because it's more difficult to, to detect the clear scene. About uh, now the albedo. So we found out, the error found out there is a good consistency of the map. And uh, I'll show just an example for the ocean is called effectant. If you go to B in the physical effect, you get the uh, same conclusion for infrared and visible. Uh, so we, I can show you that there is a good consistency of error for estimate, for error and for ZH type. 
Now, compare with MODIS, so I can do the real work. So we compare 700 with MODIS with 500. I know that's not the same resolution. The best of the clear and the homogeneous area is not, is not too bad. I think this is the best we can do so far. And under good condition of Lario and LRZ and Titanium, we say that, of course, there's almost no difference between the MODIS and probably, which validate probably. Error is about uh, less than 1%. And uh, the good condition means error is large and then the value is also nice, but uh, if you less than uh, five or six days. Uh, Compare with MODIS, uh, so another date, uh, we found that the broadband, also the same conclusion. Early, we found early, there is a little bias in the broadband, we need to, to, I mean, to investigate more seriously, probably, also there is a, still the IOC correction that we can improve for value, which was extend a little bit because. Uh, we found the beta on the infrared, but they are a little bit um, larger in the, in, the, in the middle. Now, time series of the data, that's an important uh, so, uh, tool for, for analysis. So we look at uh, something where we don't have many clouds, that is stationary steady, uh, time, steady targets. Uh, Taverna is there, not too far from here. And you say if you compare probably, uh, actually, it's kind of meters, uh, probably. Uh, previous version and we found the body, we found the good agreement. Some discrepancy or calling the number probably due to cloud, in S probably or somewhere else. But I mean Taverna started with that, I'm not really sure, but or maybe some effect of water we don't we need to understand well, mostly we I mean we have said uh, ten times everything probably then uh, we have at least we have good uh, consistency and good uh, smooth profile between probably and and uh, and modis. Uh, another side problem is found in Italy, that's a mountain area, you can see that the snow here. You said probably it is able to, to capture the snow effect. And so the no trend and a bit of the shift due to, um, to, uh, to, uh, to the disappearance of snow, snow melting period. And also we found a uh, good appear of snow which is well captured by, uh, uh, by probably. So actually we need uh, to have, actually we have good uh, consistency with the uh, two products. But, there is some, uh, I mean, it's a little bit uh, not like pattern that would be so that the light probably to uh, to ourselves. Now, we uh, look at scatter plot between uh, Modis and uh, probably that says uh, really that's pretty good in general. So you say that pretty good argument. Of course, uh, there is some little bias, especially the most problem we come from visible, but we know it's still uh, linked to the aerosol problem, mostly issues that to be involved. Although on infrared, you get good signal and the broadband also is something which is very promising and uh, keeping bear in mind that actually probably has uh, only uh, three years old uh, compared to Modis, which is almost 20 years old uh, right now. So, of course, we need to investigate this most of it, but it's very promising. So, I come to my conclusion. So, the current status of probably is pretty good and very encouraging. We get good quality of the product. Context of, I mean, actually, the first generation of touch product is to be released by Vito sooner or later. I think, uh, as it's for evaluation, it's this fall and uh, for distribution to the user as a non-static product uh, later in the year or in early 2018. Uh, we have a good consistency with Modis in the sense it's very promising. You see that atmospheric correction you know, on the cloud and also size has to be improved clearly. Uh, and the uh, static analysis for surface level indicate good agreement. Uh, for the user, there are three documents minimal that to be distributed. That's uh, ITBD, which is the algorithm that describes the method. And uh, you see in particular uh, the, I mean, the, the technique that use the camera filter we use to have uh, to capture data in time and uh, also some numerical tools that permit to improve and uh, to be more efficient in computation for inversion modeling and uh, pretty user manual that's very interesting about the format of the and the tools. There is also a tool delivered by uh, Vito that I mean some interface and you can do some some extraction of data. And that's very important. We are very aware that uh, the user needs and we need to make ease of the need because user the data is very important, validation report. It must work uh, I mean which is uh, undertaken by my colleague from AO Lab. Uh, and uh, last but least, uh, so the service validation strategy. So there is in this project the operational quality monitoring and production center at Vito. They routinely estimate that uh, average, median, first, and so on, some important 
standard statistics. They have the thematic check for different areas, they look the same in terms of thematic. Uh, uh, they try to say that there is no, much, no too much deviation because that's important. Some people they use the police tools uh, from uh, landscape certification. And um, the small variation of the thematic created by CSD, that's very important. We need to enhance, I think, the exchange with the user community. The new version of the leads to reprocessing, to assess stability and performance of the product. The reference is uh, CIOS uh, and the guideline in terms of specification, so we need to, uh, to agree with the standard format. Uh, I said the validation report, that's pretty good one, uh, that's, uh, there is an external review, so uh, independent of the project, and of uh, course they can say, okay, I did do the stamps and can see the public or not, so it's a demonstration project. This is a uh, supervised by GRC, Joint Research Center. Quality assessment, and also as when you move from one version to another, uh, you need to say what improvement is, I mean, it's carrying on the new version, what you, what you bring to the new version, and there's a change that you need to detail to the new version. Sometimes it's not a TI, we learn from the past experiments that sometimes not good. Okay, that's it, and uh, just uh, celebrate the series. Uh, Birthday of probably the challenge about three, three years ago. Thanks, uh, Jean Louis, for the nice presentation. There is time for questions. Questions to Jean. Okay, that's. Oh, oh yeah, there's one. Is that one? Oh, yeah. Hello. There is a third row here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, uh, I don't know if among your users you have global modelers. Does you uh, very much uh, be interested in having a global product? Otherwise, you will uh, completely miss this community. You make comparison with Modis, the people from Modis, they have this nice GCM, global climate modeling grid at 5 km at global scale in NCDF or HDF, I don't remember. So, I have asked several times, but uh, the product is still not here. Do you know about this? Uh, probably it will be global, uh, that's global, I think, so the, the tiny distribution will be one kilometer to assure continuity with spot vegetation for sure. And there yeah. is inter intercollaboration. Uh, about the ability of the product and, uh, and, and, and the reprocessing for 2013 for the very beginning, uh, for sure will be next year available, that's pretty clear. And that will be, I think, will be still one kilometer. There is no, I don't think there is no plan to do something at five kilometers. So maybe it's uh, too much information for climate uh, model, but uh, I don't know. But uh, we do have a global project. I mean, modelers, they don't have, they don't have time to deal with your ties. That's the meaning. Yeah, I know, I know, that's a question. We need, uh, that's a good question to, yeah, we need to see, yeah, okay. I need to, I don't know, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. I need to, we need to suggest it. I don't think that's a real issue, but maybe, uh, I mean... Time is a real issue. Yeah, yeah, I know, I bet. Uh, yeah, 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 I mean, uh, no, I mean, for me too, it's not a real issue. I mean, they can do that certainly if there is an uh, okay, item. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But maybe, I mean, the question is if you want one kilometer, three kilometers, five kilometers, that, I mean, we need to consult the target community to say, because, I, okay, that's not the same thing. If you're satisfied, uh, three kilometers, maybe it's a good trade-off. What we can do and uh, the user. Okay. Maybe, maybe, yes. Okay, so what questions are there? Yes. Just a quick question, Robbie. Um, have you considered doing a reprocessing of using common solutions rather than common filters? Because, and I asked this of Crystal in the most part, why do you only look back in time for reprocessing? So, do you? Um, Okay, I, I, can't, I can't tell you about the uh, real time because I'm, I did the uh, algorithm and so this kind of filter. If you do the reprocessing, there is a gap field, you can use a climatology or other tools to do so. You get, uh, I would say a problem with uh, <coughs> if you use this um, technique of gap field, we have only three years of data, so I'm not pretty sure what we can do with that. And, but uh, common, common filter, I think it's, I mean, I if I get the question correctly. The question was, the Yeah, we use the yeah. No, smoothly. So, uh, the non-plasma filter. I mean, look forward to that. 
as well. Your resources are some parts of the earth are 70% clouds that we're going to get to the best of our So why not take advantage? I don't, I don't know, maybe there's a happy Yeah, okay, we yeah, okay. We need to. Okay, we can talk about it. Yes. There's a question up there. Yes. So, do you do any, in, the, in this kind of um, um, filter, do you do any kind of um, correction for, for things that are changing fast, like fires or uh, snow melt or flooding or something like that? That's just, just get over smooth by, by using it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, 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 a, that's a question. Uh, we, I mean, we try to, yes, yeah, we try to try what we need to, I say, okay, there is, Put 10% for RPO, of course, we need to start from uh, something which is close to the solution. And we need, to, I think the unit is, as uh, you said, I mean, if you want to get to something no net, you need, I mean, you want to refresh your information, you have new information, you don't want to have too much a priori. So, it, I mean, most of the time it can work, and that's very interesting. So, option we took, so today is, of course, to privilege the, I mean, the refreshment, not a priori. The problem is in some areas, I mean, you don't put too much work on a priori, I mean, and you have a few data to refresh the product, we, I mean, you get something which is noisy, actually. So that's, um, you said sometimes uh, we, we try to, I, mean, I did some testing with different, uh, I mean, uh, 10 classes, component, 10 days, 20 days, 30 days. I wish the computer 10 days, that's a good trade up But it depends on the application. So as a reason, that's a present version, we, we not put too much work on a priori and we expect that from the user and we take this. The problem is in summertime, and in winter time, particularly in uh, when there's snow and clouds and so on. And of course, you want to know about snow, but there was cloud before for sure now, and you don't get any information about that. Maybe it's another question from the audience. Yes. Uh, Yeah, you have to pass the next step. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, it should be interesting. Any further questions to John Lee? Okay. I'd like to thank the speaker and uh, Jose. I think we can slowly and surely move to the poster session, which are the land surface radiation and inverse modeling.